Hey everybody, Matt Colville here. We did a poll on Twitter about which video people wanted to see next, whether they wanted a campaign diary or the next uh, running the game video. And everyone, I think it was uh, about two to one ratio of people wanted the next campaign diary. So if you want to participate in those votes, I encourage you to follow me on Twitter at Matt Colville. I've been putting off doing the campaign diary just because, well, you'll see why. We've played twice, two sessions since the last time I updated you folks. We'll talk about what happened in the game first, the narrative stuff, and then we'll talk about my analysis of it, and you will see why it's been two or three weeks since the last campaign diary. When last we left our heroes, the group, which consists of some members of the Revenant Vow and some members of the Shield of Gravisford, had just defeated a whole bunch of Dwagar in the foyer, guarding the Room Beyond. And the Room Beyond was the Vast Gate. It's a portal that leads somewhere deeper into the Underdark. And because the heroes are mighty and they have felled many powerful Dwagar, they were contacted by a Deep Gnome, one of those Verf Meeblin, which many of the heroes didn't even know what was. Remember that only two of the seven people in this group have ever played D&D before, the rest are like, wow, what is a deep gnome? And that was a lot of fun. So I enjoyed introducing them to Kornon, the deep gnome gem finder. Kornon can walk through walls. And I think originally when I introduced him, I thought that all deep gnomes could do that because I've run Night Below before. It was 20 years ago. And I remembered that these guys could basically walk through stone. And that was one of their abilities. But then when I was reading what deep gnomes could do, I was like, oh, hang on a minute. I think I have uh, remembered what happened incorrectly. I was remembering another faction that the heroes haven't met yet deeper in the Underdark. And so I very quickly was able to uh, shuffle things around and make it so that only Kornon, the gem finder, he's special among those Zverf Nibelin. The reason he's the gem finder is that he has this ability, like Relg, the Ulgo from the Belgariad, to, or was he in the Melorian? I don't know, he was in the Belgariad, to walk through stone and find pockets of gems. So that was cool. Kornon explains that Carmenaran, the high priestess of the Deep Gnomes, does not like outsiders, does not trust them, but Kornon thinks that they need help, and he thinks these heroes are the ones that can do it. Other heroes have come through here, but they are not as powerful. They're not as puissant as these heroes. And so Cordon says, listen, uh, if you guys can survive what happens in the next room, then I will take you to see the high priestess and maybe you can make some kind of bargain with her. And I think that confused some of the players because I think they thought that he was saying, if you defeat what's in the next room, if you can secure the vast gate, then I will take you to see the high priestess and you will be allies of the gnomes. But really what he was saying was, and I explained this, so we cleared up that confusion. He was saying, if you survive what's in the next room, then it's worth it for me to risk my neck and get yelled at by introducing you to the High Priestess and taking you to our secret city, the gnomish city of Zanzarite. Now, Zanzarite is a place that I made up. I basically stole a Blingden Stone from out of the abyss, and I think I'm pronouncing that right, Blingden Stone? I thought, there, no, the gnomes in my setting don't have their city named after Bling. Uh, I thought that was kind of silly. So that's an important point. People ask me this stuff all the time when they hear about the campaign diaries. I'm running an adventure published by TSR in 1994 or 1996 called Night Below, and in night below, the heroes will eventually meet the deep gnomes, which I just did, and they will go to the deep gnome city. But in night below, it's one deep gnome city. And I looked at it and I'm like, okay, that's interesting. I wonder if there are other deep gnome cities that I could use. And in fact, there's a brand new one that was published in Out of the Abyss. So one of the things the heroes can do in Out of the Abyss, which is a Wizards of the Coast adventure, is they can visit this gnomish city. But the gnomish city in Out of the Abyss is a ruin. Uh, it's been sacked by the drow hundreds of years ago, and the gnomes are kind of trying to eke out a living there. And I thought that was way more interesting than the gnomish city in Night Below, so I just swapped it out. I do that all the time, right? I think you're starting to understand when I say that I run prepackaged adventures, I don't run them by the book. I've never run anything by the book. I'm constantly tweaking stuff and stealing it, and that makes it mine. I think that, and we'll do an episode on this, and you'll probably see it when we prep Lost Minds of Fandelver, you'll see that I think that the most... Uh, it, what's efficient, most effective, the most rewarding maybe way to run D&D &D is by taking someone else's content, right, that they have spent the time making all the maps and coming up with all the names, which is super cool, and then I go through and I add and tweak my own stuff, so I've spent the least amount of my time and gotten the maximum amount of value out of it, right, you get it? So I didn't have to make all this stuff up, I'm just spending my time tweaking stuff and altering it, and because I've been doing this, it's easier for me maybe, because I've been doing this for 30 years, I can do stuff like, oh wow, you know, fighting some orcs in Night Below is kind of Boring. the heroes have already fought a lot of orcs, so instead of it being an orc tower, I'm gonna have it be a Dwagar fortress, because I remember there was a Dwagar fortress in the gates to Firestorm Peaks. So that's the kind of thing you can get away with when you just have lots of adventures that you've bought and read, and many of these I've run, and I can grab them and tweak them, and I can take one and insert it into another. 
So Coronon explains that what's in the next room is two mind flayers, one of which is a master mind flayer, and that was kind of another point of contention because I described him as being a master mind flayer, which I, is a term I don't think exists really in D&D. Maybe it does. Uh, I don't think it's in the monster manual. Not this edition, not fifth edition, but master mind flayers are something from NetHack, which is one of my favorite games, and is basically an advanced Dungeons and Dragons simulator. And then later I described the leader of the mind flayers as being the master mind flayer, and the players were like, wait, I thought we killed the master mind flayer. So I needed, really, what I needed to do was come up with a new, better title for the head of the Mind Flayers. But I like the alliteration of Master Mind Flayer, so I used it twice. So there's two Mind Flayers in the next room, one of which is a Master Mind Flayer, whatever that is, and there's a Human Wizard. That's the Human Wizard that the Mind Flayers put this Human Wizard in charge of this Dwagar Stronghold. So the Dwagar Stronghold is run by a Dwagar named Thanagart, but he has been made subservient to this Human Wizard because the Mind Flayers have moved in and kind of taken over. So that Wizard's in here, and there is one of the Knights of the Black Rose in here, and that caused a very kind of like, what is going on thing in the amongst the party because they thought that the Knights of the Black Rose were part of the conspiracy that are happening in the mundane world, the, you know, the prime material plane, and that didn't really have anything to do with the mind flares and the Dwagar and the kidnapping of wizards, but as they are discovering, pretty much everything that has happened in this campaign from the very first session, which you guys didn't get to see, the very first session they were waylaid by bandits on their way to Gravesford, and the leader of the bandits had been mind controlled and couldn't even explain, he couldn't even say who had done it to him. And that mind control is a result of these potions that the mind flares have been giving people, and they, they have learned, the heroes have learned, that the conspiracy goes even deeper, even beyond the Mind Flayers, to the Old Ones. Yes, the Old Ones. Whatever they are. So finding a Knight of the Black Rose down here involved in this conspiracy was really crazy, but it made Graves, played by my friend Phil, super engaged because he hates those guys. They killed his previous character, and he made a new character that has a really interesting reason to hate the Black Rose. That's an important point we're gonna come back to later. Phil's character died in an earlier session, and so he made a new character and came up with a really cool reason, he wrote a really long backstory, a very cool reason for his new character to have the same motivations as his old character and, and as him, right? Phil wants to stop the Black Rose, so he made a new character for whom they were his enemy. Cordon takes the heroes into what I called a cyst, like a Swiss cheese hole in the rock that he and only he can get to because he can move through stone and he can get like one person a turn. He can move the whole party through stone, but very, very slowly. So that's how he gets them there. And Sigurd, played by Lars, said, can you get me into the room with the mind flares? And Cordon's like, yeah, I can do that. Sigurd, played by Lars, says, I have an idea. Let's get everyone into the portable hole. There's 10 minutes of air in the portable hole, but they have less than 10 people in there, so that's more than a minute each, and Coronan can get me, in physical form, into the room with the Mind Flayers. I have a cloak of uh, elven kind. I have Pass Without Trace. I can make it so, basically, I'm impossible to find, and then you guys will all spring out of the portable hole, and we'll have surprise against the Mind Flayers and the Wizard and the Knight of the Black Rose. This battle against the Mind Flayers was basically the entire session from two weeks ago, and the plan went off without a hitch. Sigurd appears out of the wall thanks to Cornon, the gem finder and his ability to move through stone and immediately the master mind flayer sees him for two reasons. One, the master mind flayer has a robe of eyes and also the master mind flayer has the eye of Vecna. I had set this guy up to be a recurring villain, right? So of course he has plane shift, all mind flayers do, and I figured if things get bad, this guy can just plane shift out of here. So the master mind flayer sees Sigurd, but only the master mind flayer sees it, so only the master mind flayer gets to act on that first round of combat, and by the end, I think, of the second round of combat, the heroes had successfully killed everyone in that room, and most of them never even got to act. So that was hugely anticlimactic, and as a result, I just basically stopped that night, and I think we stopped about an hour or two early, so the battle didn't take very long, it wasn't very interesting. The only thing that really happened in the entire battle was the Master Mind Flayer got one action. He had a couple of options, and I had him cast Take the Derivative of against Nosa, or Disintegrate. And I think Disintegrate does something like 10d6 plus 40 damage, which would have completely obliterated Nosa. I knew it would have, and I didn't really want, like, the only thing that happened. It was a, in the entire battle only took, like, half an hour, and I thought that it would have been really unsportsmanlike of me to just obliterate Nosa in the only action, the only thing that happened in the entire battle. So I did roll damage, and I rolled in front of the players, but I think I rolled like 68. It was still a lot of damage, don't get me wrong, and there was still a chance that she could die, but it was far less guaranteed. I didn't really intend the Master Mind Flayer to do much in that battle at all. I expected the battle to mostly be going in his favor with just his allies. I mean, the wizard, who never got to act, can summon, he's an alienist, and so I was gonna give him the ability to summon a powerful demon, and I thought that was really cool. 
had a great figure picked out for it. So since things were not going according to my plan, and I was like, well, I need him to do something and it should be memorable, I'll have him use this super powerful thing. And that meant he didn't cast Plane Shift to get away. There was also an opportunity, not the only two or three characters had come out of the portable hole when it was the Master Mind Flayer's turn. And I thought, you know, he could just walk up to the portable hole and take it off the wall. And then the other characters are stuck in there. They have to make strength checks to get out. And he could use Plane Shift to get back home or to go to another universe or whatever. And then now we've divided the party. But I didn't do that. And you'll kind of see why as we keep going. But really, I felt like that was something Matt Colville would do if he were playing this game as a war game. It's not the kind of thing the Mind Flayer would have done. The Mind Flayer doesn't know how many people are in the portable hole. The Mind Flayer thinks that he's in charge of what's going on and everything's going to be fine. But about 15 or 20 minutes later, everybody in that room was dead. There's a huge object in this room called the Focusing Lens, which is the thing that the Dwagar in this fortress have been working on. It's their contribution to the machine that the old ones are building far below. And so I came up with a little drama that happened during the battle while these Dwagar, just regular Dwagar, they weren't difficult to kill or anything, were trying to get the Focusing Lens through the portal. So the players felt a little bit of drama there as they tried to stop it. I mean, the, the Dwagar almost got it into the portal, so that was kind of cool. So that was that session, and the heroes got, they chopped off the head of the Mind Flare and put it in the bag, and they're like, the eye of a couple of the players know what the eye of Vecna is, and they're like, do not touch that thing, put it in the bag. They subdued the Knight of the Black Rose. Graves uses his mental telepathy to try to interrogate Sir Anglim of the Black Rose. And that was a lot of fun. That was one of the coolest things that's happened in the last couple of weeks, because Sir Anglim is basically immune to being interrogated, and even though Graves was able to use his warlock telepathy, he cast, they had a potion of um, mind reading. They had a potion of mind reading that they fed this guy, and it allows them to kind of detect surface thoughts, and they got some clues out of him, but then he kind of realized what was happening and stopped it, and he made his saving throw against Graves getting more information going deeper. Specifically, some of the clues he got, which I texted to Phil, right? That's one of the things I love about modern technology, is I don't have to take Phil outside, I can just send him a text, was he thought, I have failed, right? Because he knows he's gonna die. He knows these guys are gonna kill him. He said, I have failed my owner, he says, not my master. He says, I have failed my owner, which was a clue, and I saw Phil was like, owner, and he was trying to work that out, and he couldn't figure it out. When Sir Anglin realized that Graves could read his mind, his eyes went wide, and he got legitimately scared for the only time during the interrogation, and he looked at Graves and said, the empty one. And Phil's like, the empty one, that's that's cool. What, is that? what does that mean? But he couldn't get any more out of the guy. Then Phil very cleverly had Graves say, your owner will be very disappointed in you. And that caused the name of the knight's owner to kind of come unbidden into his mind. Graves hears the word Sulor in Sir Anglim's mind. And he's like, oh, so Sulor, and he makes a note, Sulor is this guy's owner, whatever that means. And from that point forward, Sir Anglim was really antagonistic and he was hateful and he was trying to goad the heroes into killing him because he was afraid that they would have some technique that he didn't know about that would get deeper into his mind. So he's saying some spiteful things and he's not being forthcoming with information and the heroes decide to resort to torture. EJ play Nicodemus says, I cut the guy's foot off, which I thought was hysterical, but actually Sir Anglim then when he gets his foot cut off just laughs. He laughs like almost casually. He gives no indication that he even feels pain. And several of the players were like, whoa, what is going on? And they thought, is he like laughing out of spite? And there wasn't any indication of that. And I noticed, I even noticed that TJ playing Keck was like, wow, this is weird. What is going on? When it's clear they're not going to get any more information out of him and he's made his saving throw against the mind reading and they've cut his foot off and it didn't do anything except make him laugh. Graves grabs him by the hair, takes out his dagger and says, this is for the Abbey of St. Sebastian and cuts his throat. The Abbey of St. Sebastian is the kind of a library monastery that Graves was a library library assistant at when he was a young man and the Black Rose came, this is before they were the Black Rose, the Black Rose came and burned it down. And while it was burning down and the burning books are raining down on him and he's being crushed under the weight of this library, Graves calls out to the universe for revenge. And that's when Balothamog made contact with him and granted him his powers. So Graves has been on a vengeance quest ever since then to go after the Knights of the Black Rose. It's a really cool backstory. Graves doesn't know and Phil doesn't know. He in intentionally left it out of his backstory for me to fill in what was was the Black Rose they're looking for? Why did they burn the monastery down? What did they extract from it? They took something from that place and they didn't want any survivors to be able to investigate, so they tried, they thought they murdered everybody there, but Graves survived. He slits the Knight of the Black Rose's throat and he specifically said, I want to look into his eyes while he's dying so that I am the last thing he sees. So I described how he gurgles, how he twitches, and how his eyes dilate and go wide as the life leaves him. And as Graves stares into his eyes, he sees something deep red behind them. I had Graves make a saving throw. He failed his saving throw and took 2d10 damage. I rolled max damage in front of him. I rolled two zeros. So he took 20 damage. I described it like a hammer slamming into Graves' forehead. His head snaps back. And I said, Phil, please roll 3d6. 
He rolls 3d6. He's not sure why. He says, okay, I rolled a nine. I said, what's your intelligence? He goes, 11. I said, okay, your intelligence is not reduced to zero. That's language I use because I want the players to kind of know sometimes, purely for dramatic effect, what was on the table. Because, I mean, sometimes I go, okay, nothing happens. And the players are like, what is going on? But in this instance, I wanted the players to know this is what's in danger of happening to you. Because it's sort of, I think that's maybe an important point is that sometimes revealing what the bad guy's powers do, even though technically there's no way for the characters to know it, gives them the context of how is this battle going to go, right? It changes their idea of what's at stake and that changes the decisions they make. So it doesn't make any logical sense, but I have found as a tool in my toolbox, I bust out every once in a while to make sure the players don't end up kind of getting in over their head. It avoids that situation where the players are like, well, how were we supposed to know it could do that? And of course, there's no way they could know it, but certain abilities I think are so devastating that it's worth kind of warning the players. Of course, you may disagree. Graves lets go of the head of Sir Anglim because Graves has been stunned and Sir Anglim falls to the ground and his head kind of shatters and collapses and this small like Yorkshire Terrier sized brain with feet emerges. This is not the first time the Shield of Gravesford have fought one of these, but it is definitely the first time the Revenant Vow ever seen this happen. And the players are like, oh my God, it's an intellect devourer. Sir Anglim was an intellect devourer. Intellect devourers are the pets of the Mind Flayers. So of course he thinks of the Mind Flayers as not his masters, but his owner. I had the players roll initiative. This is gonna be a very short battle, obviously, because there's seven players and one intellect devourer. It has like a 12 armor class and very few hit points, but it won initiative. And so the first thing it does is it scuttles around and it attacks Baltair, because Baltair is the one that did the most damage in the combat with the Mind Flayers and Sir Anglim and the Wizard in the Vast Gate Room. Baltair fails his intelligence save, so he takes damage, and then he rolls 3d6, and he rolls 16. And I said, Tom, what is Baltair's intelligence? And Tom said, 14. And I said, Tom, can I borrow your character sheet for a second? And I scratched off his intelligence and wrote zero next to it. I said, Tom, Baltair is permanently stunned. And the player's are like, wait, b b b permanently? And I'm like, permanently. And so they're like, oh my God, what do we do? They kill the intellect of our, of course. It basically did everything it could do. And the reveal that Sir Anglim of the Black Rose was secretly an intellect of our, completely, it was like dropping a bomb on the players. They spent the next 20 or 30 minutes debating what it meant. Of course, immediately once this happens, everyone at the table is like, oh, of course, that explains why he didn't bother him at all when we chopped his foot off. He just laughed because it's not his body. The intellect of our is literally driving this guy around. They're like, and that explains his language. The reason he was talking about us like we were a different species. He was talking about our world as though it was distinct from his because it is. So that was cool. That was a cool moment. I thought it was going to be a cool moment. It turned out to be a cool moment. It's one of the only things that's gone right in the past two weeks. Phil was a little disappointed though, and that made me disappointed, of course, uh, because he said, oh, but that means I didn't get to kill Sir Anglim. The Mind Flayers got to him before I did. And I was like, oh God, I, I, I screwed up. I didn't, there was something I didn't lead up to this properly because of course my idea was that it wasn't, the, like the Knights of the Black Rose, as Phil knows, started off as a mercenary company called the Thorns. And then all of a sudden they sack this library, the uh, Abbey of St. Sebastian, and they turn into the Black Rose and they support Lord Saxon usurping the barony of Bedegar. Everything that's happened in this campaign is a result of the Knights of the Black Rose being controlled by being literally agents of the Mind Flayers. After a little while, by the end of the night, I think Phil had put together that it looked like maybe the Black Rose had always been controlled by these Mind Flayers, but they didn't know yet. They still don't really know. The players have worked out though, I think correctly, that one or two of the Knights of the Black Rose are still actual human beings. So of the seven, I think, Knights of the Black Rose, they have confronted and defeated one of them, which is cool. And I think, I think each one is gonna get their kind of last stand a moment like this. They kill the intellect of hour and they're like, great, now what do we do with Baltair? He has a zero intelligence. He is permanently stunned basically. And Baltair is just lying there on the ground. He's like in a coma. Lars says, well, I'm wearing this headband of intellect. Uh, Sigurd wears the headband of intellect because it gives him a 20 intelligence. It's an item they found, and I think, I think they found it in the stash of, in the treasure hoard of Explicitica Defilus back when they were like third level, right? And it was one of those items that I awarded that was meant to be for a wizard, but there wasn't a wizard in the party. So they just had it in the portable hole for a long time. And then when Lars started his thieves guild, one of the things he gets is he becomes a guild master, which is part of my stronghold rules. And it basically lets him simulate 
emulate being a warlord from fourth edition, right? Now he is the head of a thieves guild so he can give commands to players and basically buff the whole party. And that's all based on his intelligence, right? It gets a reason for a thief to have a high intelligence is because he, it buffs all of his guild master stuff. So Sigurd is wearing this thing and he goes, well, what happens if we put the headband of intellect on Baltair? And they put it on there and I read it and I thought, um, I can't see any reason why this wouldn't work, right? So I said, all right, Baltair's eyes open. And of course now he's got a 20 intelligence, which means he's smarter than Baltair was before. So I said, all right, Tom, Baltair opens his eyes. And the first thing you think was, that was stupid. They killed everybody else. They got some treasure out of that room, mostly from the Mind Flayers and the Wizard. And they got the Knight of the Black Roses uh, Hellfire Plate, which is this awesome black armor that damages anybody that hits you in melee. And he had a plus two great sword that they got. And among the magic items they got was the deck of many things. At the beginning of the night, I took out the deck of the Golden Tarot, which I bought off Amazon. I'll put a link in the doobly-doo. We did a whole episode on the deck of many things that I think many of you have watched, but it doesn't hurt to, you know, make sure that I put links in more than one place. So I had the Golden Tarot in this box that I bought to just keep it in. And I had one of the players, EJ, shuffle the deck and then put the deck in the box and put it on the table in front of everyone. So after he shuffled it, I never touched it, as far as you know. And it just sat there and the players were like, oh my God, is that the deck of many things? And I didn't say anything because they hadn't found it yet. So that's just a way to kind of create drama outside the context of the game. Like the players know the deck of many things is literally on the table and maybe they'll find it. Maybe we'll factor into this adventure, but they don't know how. So the entire night they're like, are we going to get to use that thing? Are we going to find that thing? And I love that stuff. So finally at the end of the night, they find the deck of many things and I describe how it works. And I, they, I tell them there are many different kinds of decks of many things. There is the deck of a wonder and stuff like that. And that's largely true, but it's also something I was telling them because I wanted to make sure they understood that the things that they've heard about the deck of many things, uh, if they've read the rules for it or anything like that, this is my unique version. And what I said was, this is not, I don't think in the actual rules, I said only one player can draw from it. And uh, as soon as they're done drawing, it disappears. And they can draw, I think, I don't know if I said any number of cards or if I said three cards. And I said, is anyone gonna draw from it? And TJ playing the Dwarven War Priest Keck immediately said, yeah, I'll draw from it. Which I loved and I think was great. It was a lot of fun. And he said, I think he kind of embodied to me the spirit of a certain way of playing d d It's one that I have played. It's one I enjoy. He admitted that he didn't know if Keck would do that. He didn't know if he was role playing his character, but he as TJ was like, when am I going to get a chance to do this? Right? When am I going to get another chance to draw from the deck of many things? Good question. And I think the answer is probably never. This is probably it. And so he went for it. He drew three cards. He drew the fool, the devil, and the hierophant. As a result, one good thing happened to him and two bad things happened to him. His weapon was, it said in the rules that he gains a useful, powerful weapon, but he already has the maul of Zerok the Lawgiver. So what I did was I had, I added an ability. I think I added Giant Slayer to, I made it also a maul of Giant Slaying in addition to all the other stuff it does. I took his character sheet from him and wrote of Giant Slaying next to the maul of Zerok the Lawgiver. And that was cool. One of the bad things that happened was he lost 10,000 XP, but it explicitly says that it won't take you below the level you're at. So he went from being midway through fifth level to just at the bottom of fifth level, which is, I mean, it puts him at a slight disadvantage. It means some of the characters might level up before him. But as he said, he's like, look, man, we get XP literally every time we play. It is kind of an unlimited resource. And then, of course, the devil means that he has the enmity of some powerful demon, which I really don't know what to do with. My first, actually, the funny thing was, my first instinct was I should go on Twitter and ask, like, Chris Perkins and Matt Mercer, like, hey, what would you do with something like this? Because I feel like their imaginations would be a lot more fertile than mine in this context. Uh, there are limits to my powers. But if you have an idea of what the enmity of a powerful demon or devil would mean, please let me know in the doobly-doo. I would love to get some cool ideas. Then the deck vanished, and that was it for that session. The next session Session, which was we just played this week, the heroes gained an audience with the uh, with Carmenaran, the high priestess of the gnomes. And of course, it meant everyone getting back in the portable hole and Coronan guiding Sigurd through the city. And every like, you know, a couple of minutes, they have to open up the portable hole so everybody can breathe and then everybody back in so they can move through the city. They have to, they can't just walk through the city like normal people because as the heroes found out, Zanzarite was sacked a long time ago and is now this crazy wild ruin. There's all sorts of amazing things happening. 
happening in it. And at one point there was an opportunity for an encounter with this huge, crazy, uh, evil monster that I'm, I'm not going to name because they didn't encounter it, mostly because Lars, I said, this creature has supernatural senses, so it can detect you. And Lars says, no, it can't. Pass without trace means I cannot be tracked. And I was like, well, but it's not trying to track. Tracking is a thing that is built into survival. This thing doesn't need to make a survival check. It can just sense you. And Lars objected to that. And I thought about, you know, this was a, this was a moment of contention. I didn't know what to do. I thought, and I said, okay, I, at my, my rule, my default rule as always is err on the side of the players. And as a result, they bypassed an encounter. And that frustrated the other players because they're like, look, man, we want to play D&D. Right. We want to roll dice and kill stuff. That is part of the fun of the game. But I completely sympathize with Lars. Right. I completely sympathize with the idea that he has built. It's not his fault that I gave the party a portable hole. Right. I gave them that in another campaign, which I had kind of considered to be over. And now it's kind of throwing a monkey wrench into things. Uh, I have a reputation for awarding a lot of magic. And that was true when I was running for the Revenant Vow because I hadn't played fifth edition before. And I didn't really know what a lot of magic was per se, but also because I didn't expect us to be playing much beyond fifth level and and that worked by the way from first to fifth level even though they had a lot of magic it wasn't that big a deal but now that we're continuing to play with these characters it is starting to throw a monkey wrench into things two items specifically they have a lot of magic items but really only two of them are causing a problem one of them is a portable hole it's not Lars's fault I ordered the portable hole that allows him to put the entire party in the bag and then use his incredible stealth uh his high really high stealth rating his uh cloak of elven kind pass without trace all the crazy stuff he can do and I don't want to take that away from him. I don't want to foil his special thing because then he'd be like, well, what's the point of playing a thief? Normally the dramatic tension of the thief is, and of course I say thief instead of rogue uh, because I've been playing D&D &D a long time, but you get it. The dramatic tension of the thief is, yeah, you can scout ahead and you can make your stealth rolls, but eventually you will fail, right? I mean, nothing works forever. And when that happens, you're going to be isolated and then parties behind you slowly following. So that's a cool dramatic tension and it's the way we've been playing up until now and it works, right? There have been a couple of times when Sigurd has been caught by the bad guys, although that's getting less and less frequent as he levels up and gets more abilities. So there's no encounter in the gnomish city of Zanzarite because Sigurd is basically impossible to see. Although I made a note of pass without trace. I wrote it down because now I have to figure out a way to foil that. And part of being a DM is as the players level up and get new abilities, they'll gain new abilities that you don't necessarily know how work. And so the first time they bust it out, you're like, whoa, what is that? I didn't know you could do that. And it will thwart an encounter or a dramatic moment. And you kind of have to allow it to work. You can't stop the players from using their cool things. But now you have a new thing added to the list of, okay, how do I continue to challenge the players as they get these new abilities? And there are answers to these questions. I mean, you're the DM, you can invent ways if you have to, right? But that's the process. So I made a note of it. And at some future date, I will find a way to thwart paths without trace. Cordon takes the heroes to an abandoned inn because this was once a thriving city in the underdark of trade and stuff like that. But now the deep gnomes are incredibly secretive. They don't trade with anybody. They haven't been able to retake their city. They've only been able to live and kind of scrape by in this one tiny corner of it. There's an inn in this corner of the city called the Pearl. This is something that I made up. This is not in Out of the Abyss that was used for traders. So it's not of gnomish scale, right? It's for the other people that came here and it's an old ruin. The windows are broken. There are stone tables. There are no chairs. The woods rotted away, but the heroes are able to stay here and rest. And the next day they gain an audience with Carmenaran, who is the gnomish high priestess. And she's in this great throne room. It's surrounded by gems. She's sitting on a giant ruby that I kind of imagined like the ruby throne from Mel Nibine, uh, uh, for the Elric books by Michael Moorcock. And that session was basically just the heroes negotiating with the high priestess of the gnomes. And that was an incredibly thorny, unpleasant process. Uh, again, one of the reasons we haven't done an update is because things haven't been going well and I've been trying to solve these problems. And we'll talk about the problems and my solutions for them in a minute. But they tried to kind of get some stuff out of the high priestess. And that's when they started to recognize, oh wait, the high priestess does not think that she owes them anything. They're like, well, we just killed these mind flayers and this wizard and we've kind of taken care of the uh, Dwagar and she's like the Dwagar were no threat to us. So it's fantastic that you've been able to do these things for you, but I don't even know why Kornon brought you here. The heroes are like, well, look, the Mind Flayers are trying to take over the world and that should concern you. And the High Priestess says, they're, they're trying to take over your world. They're not trying to take over our world. And the heroes um, reasonably said, but if they succeed in what they're trying to do, everyone is in danger, including you. And she's like, no, the gnomes will never be found. If we don't want people to find us, they'll never find us. So the High Priestess is being proud. And this created a schism in the group and it ran 
perfectly along the lines of the Revenant Vow on one side and the Shield of Gravesford on the other. These two distinct groups that I've been running at Turtle Rock, and I've been trying to merge them together into one group, but the merge is not working. And this was an example of that. The Shield of Gravesford was like, look, we get it. She needs to be kind of uh, buttered up. She needs, she's a proud queen, basically, of the gnomes. And even though she's saying, like both uh, Phil and EJ and TJ, were, well, they both explicitly said, listen, even though she's saying, we're fine, there's no problem down here, she probably thinks there is a problem, but she's too proud to ask for help. So she needs to be a little bit uh, sucked up to. But the other heroes were like, look, we're trying to save the world, right? So she should just give us the help. I don't understand why she's not just helping us because we're trying to save them. It was a huge point of contention. And what it boiled down to basically was that the Revenant Vow felt as though through sheer weight of logic and argumentation, they should be able to get the queen of the gnomes to do their bidding. Uh, but the other group was like, no man, she is royalty and she's the proud head of this very secretive race. So we're gonna have to do some nice, so Coronan got us the audience, right? We convinced him to let us see the gnomes, but now we have to kind of do something for the gnomes to get what we want. The Revenant Vow have successfully recovered the body of their friend, Sir Razalax, who is a dragonborn paladin that adventured with them, but he was dead. He was killed by the Mind Flayers by the time they found him. So they're trying to get him resurrected. Meanwhile, the Shield of Gravesford is trying to figure out what's going on, where are these potions coming from? How are these Mind Flayers mind controlling all these people in the world above and they're kidnapping all our wizards? We wanna stop that. And the gnomes are like, yeah, we know what's going on. They're like, yeah, there's this place called the City of the Glass Pool, and it's where the portal in the room you were in led to. Remember the focusing lens that the Dwaga were trying to get through this portal? Well, the other side of that portal is this place called the City of the Glass Pool. It's a Koatoa city. It's not a Mind Flayer city, but the Mind Flayers are kind of in charge there. And the gnomes explain that the Mind Flayers work for the Old Ones. The Old Ones. Which the heroes still don't know what is. The High Priestess of the Gnomes explains that uh, she is not happy that Kornon brought these heroes here because he's violated the secrecy of the city of Zanzarite, which the Gnomes, the only reason these Gnomes have survived the sack of the city is because they've gone into hiding, which they're really good at, they're illusionists. I think that was another part of the problem is the players didn't really know what are deep Gnomes. I didn't really explain it to them. They didn't understand that these are very secretive uh, people and that they are able to survive in this crazy ruined city because they're illusionists. They can create illusions and other people can't find them. The Shield of Gravesford is asking the gnomes for help defeating the Mind Flayers, and they explain, yeah, we know all about the Mind Flayers and we know where they live. Meanwhile, the Revenant Vow are saying, well, we're not really interested in that. We're trying to get our friend Sir Razalax resurrected and you're a High Priestess. And of course the High Priestess can do that. She can resurrect Sir Razalax, she can restore uh, Baltair's intelligence, and she can grant the rest of the party access to the City of the Glass Pool. They have secret ways through the Underdark that only they know, but they don't want to divulge that because if anything happens to these guys, the bad guys can use these secret ways to get back to the city. They're basically giving the heroes the keys to the kingdom and they really need to trust the heroes with that. So the negotiation isn't going well because the players, half the players do not understand why the gnome high priestess isn't just doing nice things for them because they're trying to save the world. So to kind of grease the wheels a little bit, I had her uh, restore Baltair's intelligence, which is kind of the opposite of how I thought it should work, right? It should be them doing things to impress her, but it was obvious that wasn't gonna work. So I had her do something nice for them so they would think more favorably of her. Eventually, Carmenaran, the high priestess of the gnomes, explains that if the heroes want the favor of the gnomes, if they want the gnomes as an ally, then there is something they can do. There's a part of the city, it's a graveyard, it's where the gnomes bury their dead, and it is currently under the control of this deep evil that the gnomes have never been able to defeat. She explains that graveyard is very important to us, it's where we consecrate our dead, and we haven't been able to bury anyone since this deep evil has taken it over, and the player's are like, wow, what kind of evil is it? And of course, half the party is immediately like the shield of Gravesford are like, we'll do it. Meanwhile, the Revenant Vow are like, wait a minute, why don't you just help us out because we're trying to save the world? So that was a point of contention, but eventually all the heroes agreed that they're gonna go fight this great evil and gain the favor of the gnomes, which is gonna pay off hugely for the rest of the campaign, I think. And as TJ pointed out later after the adventure, he's like, actually, it seems like there's lots of stuff we could do here, which is true. There's whole big sections of the city that have all been conquered or taken over and have different, controlled by different factions, some of which are intelligent, some of which are just sad savage, you know, bad creatures. And that's exactly true. Anytime they really need to impress the gnomes and get more out of them, they can take back another part of the city of Zanzarite. That's going to be a lot of fun moving forward, I think. And the hero's like, what kind of evil is it? And Coronan's like, well, I don't know what your word for it. I don't know what the word for it in common is. And none of them speak deep speech. He describes it as a large
large creature. Its major weapon is its breath weapon. And the player's like, oh, wow, is it a, is it a dragon? And he's like, well, I don't know. What, what's a dragon, he asks. So they start describing a dragon. He's like, yep, yep, it's that. It's got those. And then Graves says it's covered in scales. And he's like, well, what are, what are scales? He's like, oh, you know, like a reptile, like snake scales. And he's like, oh, no, no, it doesn't have a physical body. And they're like, whoa, whoa, wait, what? He says, yeah, well, it sounds like based on what you're describing, it is a dragon. But of course, this is a giant beast made of shadow. And the heroes are like, blink, blink, sh shadow, a, a, a shadow dragon, which no one at the table, I think, has ever heard of the idea of a shadow dragon, because the only two people that have played D&D in this group before played way back in the 80s. And shadow dragons are something that I think are from the 90s. Of course, I could be wrong. So they're like, whoa, a shadow dragon. This is going to be really cool. So some of the players are really looking forward to this combat. And that's where we left it. The next session, next week, this Tuesday, hopefully, the players are going to go into the graveyard of the gnomes and they're going to try and fight this shadow dragon and whatever minions it might have. So that's the story of what's happened in the last two sessions. This is what was kind of going on behind the scenes and the reason that I really did not have a good time. One of the things that happened before uh, the first session uh, against the Mind Flayers, and this was literally like the day before we played, was we were talking about how things might go and the players were worried that it might be a route. And I said, listen, the worst thing that might happen is one or two of you guys might actually die. That's always on the table, but then you just retreat and the players are like, well, what happens to us if we die? I'm like, well, you make new characters, right? That's what Skoros did. That's, that's normal. And one of the players who I shall not name because there's no reason to put them on the spot said, no, 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 no. If my character dies, I'm, I'm done. I'm not playing anymore. And I was like, wait, what? And I, and some of the other players were like, wait, what? And I questioned them about this and they dug in and said, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to make, this is, this is the story of what happens to this character. I'm not going to make a new character and try to come up with some half-assed reason why my new character would care about what's going on around here. They're like, listen, if we all make new characters, then that's fine. That makes sense. But I have my reasons for being down here and a new character wouldn't have those reasons. And it's dumb, this player thought, it's dumb to come up with some bullshit reason why my new character would care about the things my old character cared about. And I was like, but there's a whole bunch of stuff going on in this game. There's a million reasons for a new character to care about what's going on down here. And this player didn't see it that way. And that really saying, coming up to me and saying, if my character dies, I'm not playing anymore, was it turned out a very effective way to kind of shoot me in the heart and make me feel like, why am I bothering to do this? I don't know how it seems to you, but to me, I've literally never had a player say that before to me. And so it kind of ruined my game. The whole rest of that session, the fight against the Mind Flayers, my heart wasn't in it. I really didn't care how it went. After that session, I went up to that player and I said, listen, if that's your attitude, you should just stop playing now, right? I don't want my fun, my game held hostage by this one player who's like, hey, if anything happens to my guy, I'm out of here. So if you like playing with me, you better not kill my character. Now, all the players at the table are friends of mine, and this player could tell that what they had said upset me, and they didn't mean it to upset me, right? So now there was a misalignment. I was upset, and this player was just stating what they thought was an uncontroversial opinion. And they were discovering, as everyone else reacted, that this was apparently a very strange thing to say, right? The player said, listen, this is when I play Diablo on hardcore mode, your character dies, that's it. And I'm like, yeah, but we're not playing Diablo on hardcore mode, and you don't get to decide if this is hardcore mode or not. It's my game. Ultimately, the example that I used that I think shed some light on my thinking was, I said, listen, we have all at great inconvenience packed up our computers and gone over to Phil's place to play StarCraft II on the LAN. Now, you don't need a LAN to play StarCraft II together. It's something we did because it's fun to play together. It's fun to play face to face. It's fun to hang out together. And five minutes into our first eight player free for all game, I've come across your uh, base and and I decide instead of wiping you out, which I could do, I just whittle you down and then I leave you alone. And I do that because even though obviously tactically the best thing to do would be to wipe you out, you are my friend and I want you to keep playing. I want to keep everyone in the game till the end, till as, long, as long as it's reasonable, because I don't want you to get wiped out in the first five minutes of a two hour game and have to sit there playing your Nintendo DS for the rest, waiting for the game to end, because we are doing this on purpose together because we like playing games together. So even though it doesn't make tactical sense for me to do this. It is a social thing. It is a thing we are doing to have fun together. And what you have said is, no, if that's how you're going to play, then I'm leaving. It's like, if that's your attitude, you might as well just leave now because the rest of us are here to have fun together, not to play a cutthroat game of StarCraft II. Dungeons and Dragons is a million miles away from even that, right? It is a social experience. It's an opportunity to have fun together. So me as a DM, you as a player, we are constantly making adjustments 
adjustments to what should happen based logically on what our characters think, how our characters would behave, how the bad guys would act, because if they strictly acted in a simulationist sense, often things would happen that weren't fun, that were annoying, characters wouldn't go on the adventure, bad guys would wipe out the party, these things wouldn't be fun. So by talking it through, right, this is the number one question I think I get on Twitter, is people say, this player or my DM is doing something that annoys us, how do I deal with it? And the answer is always, well, talk to them like adults, right? So this player and I hashed it out, it took a couple of days actually, it took going to lunch a couple times, and this, pl this player really not understanding my point of view, and me being like, wow, I have never had somebody say this to me before, there is obviously a huge misalignment between their expectation and mine, and it took a lot of work to realign expectations. But also the other problem is these two groups are never going to become one group. That is something I realized because the players, not all of them and not in the most obvious ways, are always saying, when do we get to leave the Underdark and go back to Tor, right? The Revenant Vow is from Tor. The Shield of Gravesford is from Bedegar. And I thought I had done a good job coming up with why these guys cared about what was going on in the Underdark cared about what was going on with the Mind Flayers, which is these guys' adventure, right? And that's part of the problem is the Revenant Vow had run a complete adventure from levels one to five, and they were done and kind of waiting for a new adventure to start. But the Shield of Gravesford was on a much larger adventure. They started at level one in an adventure that was going to take them to level 10. So it wasn't like two groups had both completed something cool and I could make a new thing for both. I had to come up with a way to insert this group into this group's story. And that has not worked, basically. Whatever hooks I came up with, they're just just excuses for the players to finish something and then go back to tour. So the players are always thinking, when do we get to go home? And also there's a problem of magic items. I changed how I deal with magic items between running for the Revenant Vow and running for the Shield of Gravesford. I gave these guys a whole bunch of cool magic items, a lot of miscellaneous magic items, a couple of really powerful magic items. I gave these guys way fewer items, but of those items, each got something that was specially tailored to them. Well, I don't think all of them have gotten something specially tailored to them yet. I don't think Graves, because he lost one character and had to start again. So I don't think Graves has gotten his signature item yet, but certainly uh, Nicodemus, with the Shield of Andrum, he's gotten his signature item, and Keck with the Maul of Zerok the Lawgiver, and he also has the Belt of Girk the Mountain Breaker, which is a belt of giant strength. So Keck has something that's cool, that's a unique, literally unique item that I made up for him, and EJ has the Shield of Andrum, and he has Wound, right? Don't forget, he has that uh, Black Iron Axe of uh, Bonebreaker Doracor. So they have fewer magic items, but their items are powerful and more specially tuned to them. But these guys have way more magic, and some of those items are really powerful. Specifically, the Portable Hole and the Staff of Striking are, right now, they're game-breaking. So I went to Anna playing Nosa, and Tom playing Baltair, and Lars playing Sigurd, and I said, listen, why don't you guys make new fifth level characters for Bedegar that are custom made to be involved in this adventure and your current heroes, when you we've wrapped up stuff with the gnomes, your current heroes will go back to Tor. And then once we've finished the adventure, which may take months with the uh, Shield of Gravesford, these guys, Phil and EJ and TJ, will make new characters for Tor and we'll go back to Tor and figure out what happens next. And to their credit, all three players were like, yeah, that's cool, let's do it. Right? They didn't have any hesitation. So they are in the process of making new characters, and I believe that will solve this problem. I think one of the problems is, uh, and it takes an incredible amount of hubris to think this, but it would be stupid of me not to confess it to you. The whole point of this channel is, this is how I run the game, this is what's going on in my head. I think the problem was, I felt like, man, I've been running D&D for 30 years. I'm Matt Colville, I can do anything. Right, but I can't do anything. I thought I could take these two groups and meld them together, but I couldn't. And now in retrospect, it's obvious that the Revenant Vow, those players should have just made new characters. But now they are, now they are gonna make new characters. The problem is they haven't finished making their new characters yet. We don't have backstories for all of them. And I didn't explain properly that this next session, the negotiation with the gnomes, was going to be kind of the lead up to how the two groups split. One of the players thought, okay, this session is is the session where we split the group because I know that's what Matt wants to do. And so when the high priestess of the gnomes was saying, you need to go on this quest and then I'll grant you access to the city of the glass pool. The one player was like, no, no, we can't do that because Matt wants us to leave. And that player was frustrated thinking, how are we supposed to get ourselves out of this? Right? Because they knew that was their job. It's their job now to go back to Tor. And I was having this NPC say, no, stay here and keep adventuring, which is kind of the opposite of what I had said just a couple 
couple of days before because I didn't explain, right? I didn't, I didn't remember the information video. I didn't properly give the players the information they needed to make decisions. I didn't tell them, look, we're going to stay here in Zanzarite. You guys are going to do some stuff for the gnomes and then you're going to get the stuff you want and go back to Tor and the Shield of Gravisford is going to get the information they want and go deeper into the Underdark and I will work out how your new characters get involved there. Don't worry about that. So that was part of the reason the second session was such a pain in the butt, the negotiation with the gnomes, because half the party didn't really want to negotiate with the gnomes. They thought their job was to get back to Tor and they're like, well, well how are we going to continue going adventuring? I thought the whole point was splitting up. The battle with the Mind Flayers the week before was really anticlimactic because one of the players was hyper focused on this mantra that they had of if we don't kill all the bad guys in the first round, then we are all going to die which is not true. I don't know where that player got that idea. Uh, that's never been true in any battle I've ever run. And these players have been playing for months and they've fought lots of crazy stuff. But there was that persistent notion of if anything goes wrong in this plan, we're all going to die horribly. And so they hyper focused on coming up with the tactically optimal thing to do. And the metagaming at the table has become insane. People watching the stream noticed it. And in those streams that you can watch on YouTube, it didn't really bother me, the amount of metagaming, but it has gotten orders of magnitude worse, such that every time any player in the group takes an action, the first thing they do is they say, well, I think my character should do this. What do you guys think? And then they spend the next, it's probably about six or seven minutes arguing about what the tactically optimal thing for that character to do is. And I had to take one of the players aside and say, listen, uh, this is not realistic, right? This, we're not playing a war game. This is not seven players against one player on, at, in Warhammer. This is Dungeons and Dragons. And in a scenario where you guys know what's in the next room and you know it's a bunch of bad guys, which I kind of like, I like giving the players the opportunity to plot and scheme, right? It's often the bad guys who are plotting and scheming, but it's cool if every once in a while, the heroes get the chance to say, okay, we're going to do this and you do this and I'll cast this spell and then we'll go through the door and we'll fight them. I like that. I think it's fun. I enjoy watching the players pl plot and scheme. But once combat starts, it should take you about 30 seconds to figure out what you want to do and then you start rolling dice. And instead, what's happening is it's decision by committee. And as a result, the players are gaining this incredible tactical advantage that I don't have. I don't have a, a suite of DMs behind me helping me with all of my decisions. And it it is both, it doesn't make sense for their characters. Their characters aren't that smart. It doesn't make sense in the sense of immersion in that players don't get in a, in the heat of battle. You don't get the opportunity to spend five minutes arguing about what we're going to do next. And it also grinds everything to a halt. The battle took forever and it was only two rounds. I couldn't believe it. So that was another problem that I explained. I just talked it out with the player and I said, listen, from now on, I mean, I may go get a timer and I know lots of groups that do this, but I don't know if I'll have to do that yet. Just talking to the players is probably enough. And I said, listen, uh, this is something where you guys need to, on your turn, you need to figure out what you wanna do and it is reasonable for there to be a little discussion, right? Like, because you don't want two people to end up trying to move into the same space, basically. You cast the spell on me and then I'll go. That stuff makes sense. But this like, I'm gonna sit here and wait for the entire group to debate what the best thing for my character to do is, that does not make sense. That is too much. And so it's gonna be up to me as the DM to kind of dial back on the metagaming that has kind of gone overboard. Some discussion is reasonable. The players need the opportunity to talk, to coordinate who's gonna cast spells. Don't worry, I'll heal you on your turn. Okay, great. That kind of stuff in combat is fine. And remember, I come from a tradition in the 1980s, and I don't know how much of this was just my group, but I don't think all of it was just my group, where only one player rolled initiative. And that player was rolling initiative for the entire group. And then the DM rolled initiative for all the bad guys. And either these guys all went first, or these guys all went first. And that was kind of a degenerate case of how initiative was supposed to work, where I think that was how you started and then you added or subtracted values from that initiative based on your weapon speed or the number of segments that your spell was going to take. It was kind of crazy. We didn't play with all that stuff and having group initiative, which is what it's called, having all the heroes go first or all the bad guys go first meant that the heroes really got a chance to work together and come up with a plan and then enact their plan and then they sat back and they watched what the monsters did. It made combat very swingy, right? I, it either went Ugh, super in favor of the heroes or super against them, but planning and plotting was fun and it was actually kind of straightforward and easy. 
That kind of initiative encourages plotting and planning and scheming during combat, and that's what I remember, so I put up with a certain amount of it, a certain amount of metagaming in combat, but things have gotten crazy bad. So metagaming we need to reduce, and I talked to the player about that. Uh, I'm not gonna play anymore if my character dies is completely ridiculous, and I have talked to that player about that. Uh, half the party has way too much magic item, is an entire level ahead of the rest, and has no real reason to be down here, so they're gonna make new characters. That solution is in progress. The heroes are gonna go fight the shadow dragon if that's what it is it is and then they'll gain the favor of the gnomes the gnome priestess will raise sir razalax and that will send the revenant vow back to tor and she will grant the shield of gravisford access to the city of the glass pool and then we'll all be on our merry way the new characters i've been talking to the players about their new characters they already have really cool ideas about why they're going to be down here so i think that will help mesh i really do think that these players you know the most fun i've had running DD in the last probably 10 years was running DD for the revenant vow and the next most fun was for the shield of gravisford and I've run a lot of D&D in the last 10 years. So this was a blast. And I really do think these two, the two groups of players will mesh together. We just need to resolve some of these issues. So that's the campaign diary, long video. Uh, the last two sessions have not gone super well, but I think that I am dealing with it as best as is reasonable. I mean, it's the solution is always just talk to your players. There's a problem, make sure they understand it. The fact that their magic items are way out of whack with what is expected, they know, they are aware of, they talk about. I always, I love players who, when they have discovered some kind of hack in the rules that they know they're exploiting or something unbalanced or broken in the rules that that the guys who make it haven't patched yet. I love that player who is aware we're kind of getting away with something. This, it's, this is too easy, it shouldn't work this way because that's the kind of player who's not purely interested in gaining every tactical advantage at any cost. And that's these guys, they don't wanna break the game, they don't like having game breaking items, they want the challenge back of the earlier levels and so this is how we're gonna do it. So hopefully by next week, the Revenant Vow will have finished making their new characters and I will have come up with cool ways to get them into what's happening. They'll go fight the Shadow Dragon, they'll split up, we'll introduce the new characters and then it'll be on to the City of the Glass Pool. One of the funny things was uh, when I said it was the uh, City of the Fishmen, uh, it was either Phil or TJ, the two players who've played D&D back in the 80s said, oh, the Koa Toa, cool. And TJ actually goes, God, they have some kind of crazy God. Their God's name is something like, and keep in mind, he's remembering this, this obscure piece of data. He's remembering it from 20 or 30 years ago. He's like, it's like blip dull, blip, blip, dool, blip, doop, blip, dool, poop or something. And I'm like, dude, it is literally blip, dool, poop. You got it exactly right. And everyone's like, are you crazy? Half the players are like, that's a ridiculous name. I'm like, look, they're fishmen. But the other players are like, it's amazing that you remembered that. And TJ actually asked me, this is what I mean about players who kind of feel like they're getting away with something. TJ asked me after that at uh, dinner the other night, he's like, listen, man, uh, does it bother you when Phil and I kind of bust out stuff? Like they think, like Phil suspects, Graves suspects that the old ones, the formless ones, as another name of it, are the Aboleth. And I have neither confirmed or denied, but I've said, well, that is a reasonable conclusion based on the stuff Graves knows. I had to make an arcana check. And TJ's like, does it bother you when we do that, that we kind of use, again, in metagaming, that we use our, our player knowledge? And I'm like, no, man, it doesn't bother. If it bothered me, I would have said something to you. And the reason it doesn't bother me is because I feel like it's one of the coolest ways for the players who have no idea what's going on to get some idea of what's going on because there are other players at the table who have this uh, vague and imperfect memory of these things. Like they're guessing it's Aboleths. The great thing is they know it's Koatoa, they're guessing it's Aboleths, but that's as far as their memory takes them. They don't really know what those things do other than the Aboleths are bad news, right? It's not like they're going and looking it up in the monster. That would be bad. If we went and looked it up in the monster manual, I would consider that it's not, you can't really cheat at D&D, but it would be unsportsmanlike. So I said, no, I think it accurately simulates the fact that some of you guys like Graves worked in a, a library that had a lot of arcane knowledge in it. So of course, he's read about this stuff. It makes perfect sense. Keck is a dwarf. Dwarves live and explore underground. They know a lot about the Underdark, and so yeah, they would know about the Koatoa. So that stuff makes sense to me, and I think it's neat to watch the players interact. It's more fun to have some of that that lets the pressure off me having to be always being the one explaining everything in dramatic ways. Because players don't like having things explained to them. They like finding things out. And it's neat to come up with cool reasons for them to find things out, but it's nice for the players to just know stuff too. That makes it, it breaks the monotony of the relationship between us being just me doing the explaining and them doing the learning. Having it sometimes be them doing the explaining to each other is neat. 
So that's it. Last two sessions, no bueno. Huge misalignment between the two groups, between me as a DM and the players and what their expectations are. And I think we have largely resolved all that. We haven't yet gotten to the point. There may still be a little bit of friction uh, because we haven't completely unraveled the knot that is these two groups. But once that has happened, once the Revenant Vow are back on their way to Tor, and once they've made new heroes and there's one unified group, I think everyone will be having more fun. Otherwise, if that doesn't happen, we're gonna stop playing D&D, basically. We're gonna all make new characters because the last two sessions were miserable. And if that doesn't improve, which I think it will, I have every reason to think it will, then we need some something more drastic needs to happen. So that's it for the campaign diary, folks. The next video is gonna be the sequel to the miniatures video. It's the second in a three-part series called Getting on the Grid. The first part we already did was miniatures, where to get them. The second part is the grid, where to get one and terrain. And the third one is how to run tactical combat, which is I think really the juice of this series. But I didn't wanna go just straight to how to use minis and a grid to run tactical combat in an interesting way. I wanted to kind of get you up to speed and say, step one, get some minis. Step two, get a grid. Step three, Here's how to run bad guys in a way and make decisions to challenge the players, but not necessarily wipe them out, that kind of stuff. Everything I've learned in the last 30 years, I'm not a tactical genius, but I do have some tricks up my sleeve and I'm looking forward to imparting them to you because I am a river to my, you get it. Thanks for watching everybody. New video, hopefully soon. As usual, there are no ads in this channel. I do not have a Patreon. If you wanna help support the channel, I encourage you to come by my Amazon page. There's a link in the doobly-doo. I am an independent fantasy author. That means I sell my books direct to you. They're hard-boiled fantasy. Uh, I think you'd probably like it. Who knows? If you like D&D, I think you'd probably like it. I have two books, each one is four bucks, of which I see three bucks, so if you buy both books, you're throwing me six bucks. And there will be a third book, it's a five book series, so stay tuned. Lots of people have bought them and lots of people have really enjoyed them. They've reached out to me on Twitter, please come follow me on Twitter. I also have a subreddit, slash r slash Matt Colville, which is a great place to go for kind of long form discussion. I don't get to every question, but it does give me the opportunity to write really long responses that we can't really do on Twitter. And I try to avoid really long answers in the YouTube comments because I don't think everybody sees the YouTube comments. The YouTube comments get sorted based on popularity and upvotes and stuff like that. Whereas it's much easier, I think, for people to read through all the stuff on the subreddit. So there are links to all this stuff in the doobly-doo. Next episode, Terrain. Until then, peace. Out.